Welcome to Angels in the Glen. In the last lesson, we saw how King Nebuchadnezzar sets up a gold image. At the sound of the music, everyone should fall down and worship this image. And if they don't, they're under penalty of death. And we saw how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or I should say Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, refused to bow down. They said, as a matter of fact, King, we're not going to bow down. Our God can deliver us. And even if we, he doesn't deliver us, we're not going to bow down and worship. And we saw that God delivered them while they were in the fire. You see, he didn't deliver them from the fire. He delivered them in the fire. And in the fire, they're drawn closer to God himself, drawn to closer to Christ himself. And so we too need to accept the fiery trials that God may put our way because we're drawn closer to Christ. And we're also a witness through that by being faithful to the word of God and faithful to the law of God, that we can bring others to Christ. We can bring others the knowledge of Christ. But what we're going to do in this lesson is basically, we're going to see that we're going to cover three things. One, the personal and physical presence of God. We're going to take a look and see that when we look in the Old Testament, the personal physical uh, presence of God is associated with burning fire. We're also going to take a look at the nature of fire and that only the righteous can live in the fire. And then what we'll do is we'll actually compare the elements of the story that we did in last section. We'll compare that to end times and see a whole new pattern or we'll see the same pattern emerge and discover some new truths as we move to Revelation. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to go through a handful of scriptures related to that when we see many times when God appears in the Old Testament, we see that the glory of his presence is referred to as a burning fire. Take a look at Genesis 15. God is establishing a covenant with Abraham. And so he's established this covenant with Abraham. He splits the animals in two. Verse 17, it says, It came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. Okay, On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. Okay, Take a look at a few other scripture verses. God's presence, establishing a covenant with Abraham, fire. A, fire, a smoking oven, and a flaming torch. Move to Moses and the burning bush in Exodus 3.1. Moses pasturing in the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. And so he sees, he comes to Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. And we know God has a conversation with Abraham, with Moses, directly from that bush. He says, the place where you're standing is what? Holy ground. All right? And so he has that conversation. We saw in the Blue Stone, that's where Moses would get commissioned to go to Egypt and return, bring his people out. Fiery burning bush, Moses talking with God. Another verse. How did God bring them out of Egypt? Exodus 13, verse 21, The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Okay, God's presence. Abraham, smoking oven, flaming torch. Moses, burning bush. Children of Israel coming out of Egypt, pillar of fire continually before them as they were going. Wow. God's presence, fire. Another verse. When they came to Mount Sinai, Exodus 19, verse 18. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace 
and the whole mountain quaked violently. Okay, this is when they're about to receive the Ten Commandments. Moses is about to go up on the mountain and receive them. But can you imagine what this must have looked like? The Lord descends upon it in fire. See, this is God's presence. Fire is God's presence. In fact, in Exodus 24, 17, it says this, As to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. A consuming fire. It's very difficult for us to imagine that or see what that looks like, but a consuming fire on the mountaintop. God's presence consuming fire. This is one of my favorite verses. Um, Oh, actually, I'll get that into the nature of fire. But now, I just wanted to show you a handful of verses that showed you that the, that the presence of the physical God, his, the personally experiencing God, was fire. Okay, now let's take a look at the nature of fire. And I want to go through nine scriptures really quickly just to give you a flavor of this. Okay, first one I want to share with you is Isaiah 10, 16. This is basically a judgment scene. Therefore, the Lord, the God of hosts, will send a wasting disease among his stout warriors, and under his glory, a fire will be kindled like a burning flame, and the light of Israel will become a fire, and his holy one a flame, and it will burn and devour his thorns and briars in a single day. This is end time judgment. And he will destroy the glory of his forest and of his fruitful garden, both soul and body, and it will be as when a sick man wastes away. And the rest of the trees of his forest will be so small in number that a child could write them down. Another verse, judgment, Isaiah 30, 33. For Topeth has been long been ready. Indeed, it has been prepared for the king. He has made it deep and large, a pyre of fire with plenty of wood, the breath of the Lord. Look at that. The breath of the Lord, like a torrent of brimstone, sets it afire. The Lord breathes. And fire comes out. Third verse, Isaiah 31 verse 9. His rock will pass away because of panic, and his princes will be terrified at the standard, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Look at that. Whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace in Jerusalem. Remember, Zion is God's holy mountain. Zion is the place where God dwells. And here we see fire. Where does God dwell? Most holy place. Tabernacle. This is where God is. Okay? Fire. Next verse. This is one of my favorite verses. My, one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible to understand uh, who God is, what he looks like, and just what is surrounding him. Go to Daniel verse se- chapter 7, verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Stop right there. Think about this. His throne is ablaze with flames? Now, before someone shared this verse with me, I was like, I I didn't really have an opinion about it. I just thought, oh yeah, the throne of God must be glorious, must be beautiful, must be bright. Um... But I would have never, if you would have said that the Lord's throne was ablaze with flames. I mean, he sits ablaze with flames in in a a seat in a throne that's ablaze with flames. Wow. Keep going in the scripture verses. It says this, its wheels were a burning fire. Amazing. Not only is his throne ablaze with flames, his wheels. We talked about this in the blue stone. God does not sit motionless. He's in a hot rod, if you will, moving about the universe at will, blazing flames, burning with fire. Look at verse 10 right here. Even more. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. A river of fire is coming out, flowing from before him. Okay? Thousands upon thousands were attending him and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were open. It's a judgment scene. We'll talk about that in Daniel 7. I just want to give you a sense and a flavor of God's presence, his nature. Everything is associated with fire here. Okay, Hebrews 12, 29. Next verse, for our God is a consuming fire. No question about it. I want to show you something here, though. And I want to get more in specifically. Take a look at Malachi 4, 1 through 4. Just read through this, and I want you to see a flavor. This is end times. 
This is, this is when Christ returns. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze. Again, this is the second return of Christ, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You see, God's presence, God's righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. This will be a healing for God's righteous people. It says, verse 3, You will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. It's pointing to the blue stone. It's pointing to God's eternal law, his commandments that were written on stone, but now they're written on our hearts. Remember, walk in obedience, not because you're, not because you're to be saved. We're not saved by keeping the law. We're saved because Christ died for us. He is the law. And so we, we, we obey because he first loved us and we want relationship with him. Last two verses here real quick. Take a look at 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 7, the return of Christ Jesus. And to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you is believed. You see, Christ is coming in flames of glory with angels, flames of fire, okay? This is his second return. And I want to share with you um, what is actually going to happen? Second Peter gives us a clue in terms of how the earth is going to be destroyed. Look at Second Peter chapter three, verse 10. "But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar." What's that? The day of the Lord will come like a thief? OK, meaning, be, be ready. Okay, you do not know the day or the hour that the Lord is going to return. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in which heavens will pass away and with a roar of the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. Verse 11, since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? It's very clear when the Lord returns, he will return in flaming fire. He will destroy the earth with intense heat and burn up all the elements. And and Peter is saying, because of this, okay, because of this, what sort of people ought you to be? What should you be in conduct and holiness? The Lord God is real. The Lord Jesus Christ is returning. He's called us to live holy, obedient, separate lives from the world. We are not to be living like the world lives. We're to be like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We're not going to worship the things of the world. We're not going to value the things of the world. God wants us to be holy and separate. I'm encouraging you now. God wants you to be holy and separate, knowing what's going to happen in the end, knowing Keep reading this, verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord. Meaning, I'm looking forward to the second return of Christ. I'm, I'm, I don't value anything in this world other than witnessing the great love of Jesus Christ. That's what I value. We're called to be witnesses. We're called to live godly and holy, pointing people to Christ. That's the only thing I live for today and, and, and distinguishing myself like Daniel does, which we'll study in chapter 6. Because God's given us responsibilities and, and, and a purpose while we're here. But I'm looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. And I hope you are too, because he's coming soon. We keep reading. Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. See, that's, what, that's our hope. Our hope is the future. We're looking forward to a new heavens and new earth 
in God's kingdom and Christ will rule and reign forever and ever. There's one more scripture verse that I want you to see here. And I want you, if you have your Bibles, I want you to take part of your hand and cover it up. And I'll cover it up on the screen here. But this is one of the most important scripture verses I can convey to you in terms of the nature of fire and God's presence here. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah 33, verse 14. And if you have your Bibles, just cover up verses 15, 16, and 17. Don't look at it yet. Just look at verse 14. I'll show it up on the screen. Verse 14. Sinners in Zion are terrified. This is the presence of God. Zion, holy Jerusalem, presence of God, most holy place. Sinners in Zion are terrified. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can live with consuming fire? Who among us can live with the consuming fire? Who among us can live with continual burning? I mean, Isaiah is asking this question. How can we live with a burning, fiery, glorious God that is a consuming fire? How do we do it? How is it possible? How can we possibly live in front of the presence of God? I'll tell you this. The answer is verse 15. Look at verse 15. He who walks righteously and speaks with sincerity, he who rejects unjust gain and shakes his hand so that they hold no bribe, he who stops his ears from hearing about bloodshed and shuts his eyes from looking upon evil. I'm telling you, dear heart, I'm telling you, let's not fool around. It's time to get serious about our, our, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the Bible. We need to be careful what we see. We need to be careful what we hear. It's so easy to pull out our phones. It's so easy to pull out our computers and watch things that may be questionable. We know there are very bad things on the internet, but I'm talking about maybe some things that might seem innocent. We laugh and we poke fun at them and we think it's all funny and everything. Be careful. Let's, not, let's make sure, like the scripture says, we stop our ears from hearing about bloodshed. Okay? We shut our eyes from looking upon evil. Verse 16, he will dwell on the heights. His refuge will be the impregnable rock. That's Jesus Christ. His bread will be given him and his water will be sure. You might say, what, what does that mean? His bread will be given him, his water will be sure. In fact, if you were to go, I'm not going to do it now, we'll do this later, but if you were to go read Psalm 91, that's an end time prophetic psalm about those that will live in the final days of earth's history. You'll see, a thousand will fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it will not befall you. These are the people of God. These are holy, committed Christians, not caring about their lives, saying we're not going to bow down and worship this image. No, we're going to be committed to the loyal, one true God and to Jesus Christ, his son. Okay? That means when everything is chaotic, God is with us and he will provide for us. That's the beautiful thing about this. God wants us ready and he's going to provide. There's no question. Just wholly commit your life to Christ. It's that easy. Look at this. Verse 17. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. They will behold a far distant land. Meaning they're going to see Christ coming on clouds of glory. And they will not. They will live with the continual burning. The fire will move in them and it will burn and devour the earth. And we, those who are in Christ, will be able to walk about. It won't even affect us. Wonderful verses, wonderful, reassuring, comforting verses. Now, I want to compare this. We saw in chapter 3, we saw the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar sets up this image and he says, When you hear the music, bow down and worship. And I want to show you on the screen the elements of the story that we just read about. Let's talk about them real quick. Look it up on the screen. One, King Nebuchadnezzar sets up an image. He forces people to worship. He says, when you hear the music, you are, are to fall down and worship. And if you don't worship, that's forced worship. If you don't worship, you'll experience the penalty of death. In that story's case, it would be a fiery furnace. It's false worship because it's not worshiping the one true God. It's worshiping a golden image that a man, King Nebuchadnezzar, had set up. And we know in terms of uh, in terms of the story, that the three Hebrew worthies said, no, you're basically telling me to break commandments one and two. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. And it was for all peoples, nations, and languages. It was for everyone. No one was excluded. 
And I highlight the fact that the treasurers were involved. I'll unpack that in a second. And I also highlight the fact that its height was six by 60 cubits, okay? Now I want you to see something here. We're gonna unpack this in, when we get to Revelation. We're gonna go through every single detail and we'll identify all that what this means, but I just want you to see the pattern of Daniel chapter three that occurs in Revelation 13, verses 14 through 18. I've color-coded these things so you can see it a little bit easier on your screen. If you can't, we'll read it. You'll see the pattern emerge just the same. Look at Revelation 13, verse 14. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast. I'll unpack this when we get there. So it's the earth beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. There you see image, there you see forced worship, there you see false worship, there you see a penalty of death, they'll be killed, and ultimately breaking commandments one and two, because thou should have no other gods before me, you shall not make unto thee any graven image and set up an image and worship it. Look at verse 16, and he caused all, he causes all, the small, the great, the rich, and the poor, and the freemen, and the slaves, to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. All, meaning peoples, nations, languages. This is everyone. This is global on a scale. Verse 17, and he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. You see that? No one will be able to buy or sell. That's why I include the treasurers there. The treasurers were there in Daniel 3. Except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man, and his number is 666. Do you see the play on correlation between 666 and the 6 by 60 cubits there in terms of the height of the image? Okay, I only point this out to say this. Very soon, global events are going to unfold and Revelation 13 is going to be fulfilled. Okay, this is going to be a war of worship. Okay, it's about worship. Because if we go back to Isaiah 14, this is what Lucifer wanted in the beginning. Because of his pride, because of his beauty, because of his rebellion against God, he wanted to be like God. If you see Isaiah 14, worship was at the start. Look at these verses. How have you fallen from heaven, O star of the morning, son of the dawn? You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, where does he say it? He says it in his heart. Okay, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the amount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Wow. I will make myself like the Most High. This is Lucifer. Yes, the highest created order being in the universe says, I'm going to be like God. It was about worship at the beginning. In fact, what did Lucifer do after he fell? He became Satan, Satan, our adversary. And in Matthew 4, we see he even tempts Jesus to worship him. Look at this verse. Look at it closely. Again, the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Wow. Yes, at the fall of Adam, because he sinned, the, the kingdom of the world became Satan's, became Lucifer's. Jesus does not dispute his claim here. But think about this. Look at the height. This is the height of insanity. It's just absolutely craziness. It's the, it's, the, it's the utter deception and pervasiveness of where sin will take you. Because sin took Satan this far to actually say to the Creator, to the Creator, to Jesus Christ who created him, worship me. Are you serious? Tempts the Creator. And what does Jesus say? Go, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 
There will be a people of God at the very end of time that worship God only, period. They will not bow to this image. And that's why it's important to understand because it was about worship in the beginning with Satan, with Lucifer. He tries to tempt Jesus before the cross to worship him. And in the end, Revelation 13, 15, it was given him to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many who do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. It's going to be worship at the end. Okay, so the idea of fall down and worship is coming to us on a global scale. And we'll unpack all this. We'll unpack all this as we finish Daniel and we get into the book of Revelation. We'll see exactly what's going to happen. Because one of our anchor scriptures, and you know this, Amos 3, 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he first reveals his secret counsels to his servants, the prophets. Meaning he's not going to do anything unless he first reveals it to them. Okay, so if we study the prophets, we can know what God has revealed to them. Okay, it doesn't make us prophets. <laughs> it makes us students of the Bible because God wants his people ready. There's only one question I have for you. And I want to leave with, and we'll, we'll close out in this lesson. We saw how the presence of God is associated with fire. The glory of God is associated with fire. Fire, blazing flames, throne, wheels of fire, river coming out from him. Our God is a consuming fire. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar approaches the fiery furnace and he says, he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out you servants of the Most High God? Because he says he came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. Now, we know that the men that threw them into the fire, they were consumed by the fire. Why isn't Nebuchadnezzar consumed? Because God is reaching out. God is moving on his heart. God is interacting with him. Even though he's still a pagan king, you see, our God is a loving God, but he, he wants people to know who he is. He wants people to come to the saving grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and it's only through Christ that we're saved. And so King Nebuchadnezzar can get close to the fire while God was in it, while Jesus Christ was right there in it, because he wants to save him. God is patient. God is kind. He's allowing time for people to understand who he is, who his character is, what he's all about, because he loves us. He loves you. And if you've never heard this message before, God loves you and he wants relationship with you. And by doing so, we're brought into a relationship with Christ, just like he's, he was with King Nebuchadnezzar. And we'll see in next the next lesson, Daniel chapter 4, how King Nebuchadnezzar has a full conversion and he comes to know the true and living God in a personal way. So as always, we've got study guides for you. Go ahead and download them. You can print them out. You can write on them. It'll help your personal Bible study. You can use them to share or teach anything you want to do. Uh, let's close in prayer. Father God, I pray that you are the burning fire within our hearts. I pray that we would be careful what we listen to, what we see with our eyes, what we hear with our ears, and that you would be with us always continually. In Jesus' name, amen.